книге пророка Исаия. In the book of Isaiah we read, In the last days the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. In 1630, an English ship set sail for America. These were a few hundred Puritans, dissidents, and adventurers who disagreed with the politics of the English king. They wanted to build a new life in America and create an ideal country. One John Winthrop, a preacher and future governor of Massachusetts, preached a sermon on board. In it, he summoned that quote from Isaiah and continued with these words, We will be as a city upon a hill. The eyes of all people are upon us. These words have been the guiding principle of American foreign policy. This principle has been on tragic display in the second half of the 20th century, beginning immediately after World War II. We all remember these events. The Cold War, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq, and closer to home for us, Yugoslavia. They forced everyone to look at this shining city on a hill. They didn't ask, rather forced others to gaze upon them. But on January 6, 2021, the shining city flickered. Tens of thousands of Trump supporters stormed the Capitol building, the heart of so-called American democracy. Winthrop's sermon ended with these words, If we shall deal falsely with our God in this work, we shall be remembered in infamy through the ages. His words turned out to be prophetic. Welcome to the American Method series. Today, we'll talk to a descendant of one of the founders of America. Welcome to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. What a big house you have. It's an old house built in 1892. The signature of the great-grandfather of this man can be found on the Declaration of Independence. George Ross was of Scottish heritage. He signed the Declaration of Independence, one of two signers from Pennsylvania. Betsy Ross. His niece was Betsy Ross, a popular person in American history. Philadelphia Here's a painting of George Washington and my great-grandfather giving her the commission to sew the first American flag. That's the one with 13 stars symbolizing the 13 colonies that founded our country. That's my father who was born and raised here in Lancaster. He was a foreign correspondent and was head of the Associated Press Bureau in Moscow in the late 60s and early 70s during the Brezhnev years. That's me on Red Square when I was about six. This is... Charles Bousman, editor of the Russia Insider news site, which focuses on Russia, media criticism, and Orthodox Christianity. He lives in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and is an outspoken critic of neoconservatism and globalism. He's a graduate of Columbia University in New York with degrees in finance and history. Married with four daughters, he is a convert to Orthodox Christianity. His sources include American politicians, current and retired intelligence professionals, prominent think tank analysts, and political activists. 
Bousman believes that the storming of the Capitol was a carefully planned false flag. He has been an eyewitness to events in America over the past months. Take a look. be naive to think that the FBI and similar agencies did not have agent provocateurs in the crowd. Their assignment was likely to uh, start fighting with the police, breach the, the police barriers, and incite the crowd to join them. Um, but uh, it's also entirely possible that they did not realize that it would get so out of control because at the end of the day, uh, most of the people in that crowd who stormed the Capitol were just the regular Trump uh, uh, supporters who were in the demonstration. Um, and uh, it's very possible that those agencies were thinking that all they needed to do was have some TV footage of some fighting with police and some barriers getting knocked over and that that would be enough to discredit Trump and make him look bad and make his supporters look bad. Now everybody can see that. We got the power together. We did this shit together. Oh yeah. So I think it's a combination of both things. Um, and there's a reason for that. There was a reason why the crowd was much angrier than perhaps people expected. Because just two hours before that, while Trump was making his speech, Mike Pence stabbed him in the back. Uh, in, ca in the Capitol building because Mike Pence, Objection the vice president, the had the constitutional the right Wyoming, to stop the, the counting of the electors uh, because he had gotten re official requests from the state legislatures where the votes were being challenged. Pennsylvania, where we're sitting right now, Georgia, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona. Um, all these places had said, look, we don't think that the election was done properly in our state. We want more time to try and figure out what happened. So Mike Pence had every right to say, I can't certify these electors. Let's send it back to the states and give them some more time. Um, and it's also very important to understand that uh, uh, when the crowd was in front of the White House, it was a very peaceful crowd. Uh, there was none of this anger and uh, there was no incitement from the president or his his son or other people who spoke um, uh, that was making the crowd angry. And they were walking down to the Capitol to have a peaceful demonstration in front of the Capitol. And the violence in front of the Capitol started before the main crowd arrived. So that, again, is a sign that there was something going on um, in terms of creating a false flag. Um, and, you know, it's, uh, it was immediately said, and it's just becoming more and more common among the Trump supporters to believe that there was some sort of a false flag. And there's lots of evidence coming out. For example, um, the Capitol Police is a very small, the Capitol Building Police is a very small police force, and all they're supposed to do is police that, that general Capitol area. They're not even the city police. And they're used to, like, you know, dealing with tourists, checking... Uh, checking if people have their, the right identification, you know, making them go through the security check. It's almost like what people do at the airport. They're not trained for serious uh, crowd control. They're not trained for high stress situations. And it's considered uh, a very sort of, you know, not a powerful and not a very serious police force. So apparently this Capitol Hill police requested support from more serious uh, police organizations like the Pentagon, like the National Guard, like the DC P City Police, and so on and so forth, and they were rejected. And so there's a lot of speculation that that was done deliberately to make the work of the provocateurs easier. Um, and just to contrast this, uh, when, the, uh, when the riots happened over the summer, uh, in D.C., or the demonstrations, I should say, in D.C. over the summer, and there were riots in other cities of America where there was more violence. Um, 
there was enormous police presence in Washington, D.C. There was the National Guard. I, th I think the Pentagon got involved. Um, you know, there was a very, very, very strong and heavy police presence. And it turned out not to be necessary. So the, the, what, the, what the Trump supporters are asking, so wait a minute, if for the George Floyd r demonstrations and riots, you had this massive police force, but then when you had half a million people on, uh, on the mall from see, supposedly dangerous uh, Trump supporters, why did you have this tiny little police force that wasn't at all prepared to deal with what they were dealing with? And then, of course, you have all this video showing uh, the Capitol Hill police putting up some resistance and then basically giving up very quickly, opening the barricades, opening the doors, uh, and not giving a serious confrontation. Police are squabbling with protesters. Oh, there we go. America is not only split, I think the better word would be fractured or splintered. Because yes, it's split between conservatives and liberals. It's split between Trump supporters and people who hate Trump. Um, it's split between uh, the liberal coastal cities um, and the interior, which is much more Christian and much more conservative. Um, it's split between North and South. Uh, uh, it's split racially um, with, you know, blacks pitted against whites, pitted against Latinos. Um, and it's, it's a serious problem. Uh, perhaps the biggest split of all is between the rich and the poor. That there were a lot of poor Americans and middle class Americans who had become poor because of this globalist system uh, in America. And since in the last 12 months, this has gotten much, much worse because when they locked down the economy because of COVID, the big corporations benefited enormously. So Amazon benefited enormously, Facebook, Google, um, and also all the big chain stores. For example, they closed down all the small restaurants and small shops. Well, all that business went to the fast food chains, it went to Walmart, it went to the big box stores. Um, and so Americans have become demonstrably poorer uh, in the last, uh, to the extent, uh, the, the billionaire class in America over the last year has become wealthier by 30%. That money has come out of the middle class and the working class. And people are very, very angry about that. And they're also very worried about the future because so far they're surviving on the checks they're getting from the government they don't understand how they're going to survive in the long term, and they're angry about losing their businesses. What we have from the left, from the intellectual left, from the media, is this really aggressive pushing of uh, the weird transgender ideology, um, uh, sexual perversion, legalization of gay marriage, uh, gay adoption, uh, encouraging of all kinds of sexual depravity. and. The country is, oh, also abortion. Uh, there's a continued debate about abortion and the left is pushing for even later and later term abortions. And the country is deeply, deeply split on this. Um, and it's almost as if they're trying to get Americans to fight with each other. When the elections were stolen, that's when it really declined dramatically because uh, the right to uh, elect your own political leaders to representative government was basically taken away from the American people. That's one of the fundamental aspects of American democracy and freedom. Um, secondly, the most important one really, it really is the most important one, is the freedom of speech. Um, and that was gradually declining over the last several years, but after the election, it went into overdrive, and they just started banning everything and everybody, and it's and it's gotten worse and worse and worse to the point where they're now banning the president and, and major public figures, and it's turning into a complete, like, wartime situation practically, where they're locking things down. American dem uh, democracy uh, is on the ropes; it's about to be taken away. And honestly, if Trump does not succeed, or the Trump supporters do not succeed now in defending those rights, 
Americans will probably lose them forever. And also, it's important to understand that uh, this is happening not because uh, of some uh, hatred for Trump by the establishment and the deep state. They were trying to do this anyway. If Trump had never appeared, if Trump had never been elected, their chosen candidate was Hillary, and she advocated all those positions. And so the whole system has been moving towards this inexorably uh, for years. Americans today are very afraid um, to voice their political opinions. And I'll give you a simple example. I live in a small city. Um, I know a lot of my neighbors up and down the street. I've gone up and down the street uh, in the last couple months and just talked to people, knocked on doors, or when I see them in the street, I ask them. Uh, you know, I've got a Trump sign in my front yard, but nobody else on my street does. But I found many people who like Trump. And they've told me, listen, I like Trump, but don't tell anybody, please, because I don't want people to find out, because I'm worried somebody's going to throw a rock through my window or be mean to me, or I don't want conflict with my neighbors. So yeah, Americans are scared. Um, and they have actually a good reason to be scared, because the predominance of the power that can really affect their lives uh, is on the other side, okay? So first of all, most importantly, their employment, right? If they get a reputation of being the kind of person who supports Trump um, and, and you know, believes in Christianity and is against uh, sodomy and all these things, um, there's a very good chance that they won't get the promotion at work, they might lose clients, they might, their children might not get into the right uh, universities. And so there's a lot of incentive for people just to keep quiet and not cause trouble because the predominant power now is in big business and everything is connected to big business. People have been doing this for a long time and they're, they are afraid to express their political opinions. A lot of them are. And that's why you see, for example, the polls are so inaccurate. Whereas, you know, the polls, people, when they talk to a pollster, they won't say that they like Trump. When they go into the polling group, the polling booth, they'll vote for Trump. So, um, it's a real problem and it's a real sad day in America that people are afraid to express their political views. Basically this radical leftist uh, ideology has been creeping into American society already for decades going back to the 1930s. But it really came here in force after World War II uh, in the 40s and 50s. Uh, when radical leftist intellectuals from Europe uh, and, uh, and a lot of them from Germany um, fled World War II, came to America and established themselves. So those were the neoconservatives who were actually Trotskyites, um, uh, who actually came into the U.S. through Mexico, where there was a big Trotskyite movement. Um, and then they switched and started calling themselves uh, con conservatives, whereas for, beforehand they had been, you know, radical left Trotskyites. Um, and they, by the way, run American foreign policy today, the neoconservatives. It's a well-known phenomenon. Um, but you had all kinds of other uh, intellectuals and academics and a lot of professors and people who went into the university systems who came over in the 40s and 50s. And uh, it's famously known here in America as cultural Marxism. And they deliberately with the idea of turning America into a, a Marxist utopia over the long term, they were thinking in terms of 30, 40, 50 years, they infiltrated academia, the book publishing industry, the State Department, the media, schools, and uh, they've had a profound, profound effect. So their, their first big success, the result of this work that they were doing with the American public, was in the late 60s, early 70s, when you had this uh, hippie revolution, basically. Um, and uh, the liberalization of drug use, the liberalization of sexual behavior. Um, and it's just kept going from there. And today, if you go into, if you send your children to an Amer most American universities, including the most elite ones like Harvard and Yale, they will sit down with professors who are Marxists and who will teach them uh, these ideologies.
and uh, there was a feeling that America had to be like the world's policeman and to be involved in countries all over the world and in, in Southeast Asia and South America stopping the the rise of communism. Um, when the Soviet Union uh, ceased to exist and America emerged as the only superpower, that's when this universalist idea that we have to control the whole world and uh, that the whole world has to go according to our system and our ideology and our beliefs uh, really gained the upper hand. And for example, that's when you see these, uh, the neoconservatives really take charge of American foreign policy and we're pushing wars, especially in the Middle East, and destabilizing all these countries in the Middle East. Um, but there's always also been a sense of Amer in America that that's not what America should be doing, that America should be looking after American interests and Amer the American people. Um, and that was very a very strong sentiment, for example, before World War II, and it prevented America from entering World War II for a long time because it was very popular and Roosevelt finally overcame it. At that time, uh, the anti-war movement uh, during World War II was called America First. And so when Donald Trump came back with that term uh, in 2016, um, people accused him of being, you know, uh, practically racist, uh, an isolationist for using that term, but it was very deliberate. He wanted to return to the America that was before World War II, where America did not meddle in other countries and focused more on just making America a great country. And one of the reasons why this is so popular among the American people is because of this globalist, uh, universalist ideology that took hold in America, especially uh, starting in about 2000, the, uh, the regular American people were suffering because of this. Um, this enormous military, global military presence that we had to maintain is very, very, very expensive and it means that we're spending a ton of money on things uh, outside of America when there are many poor people and many needs needed in America. At the same time, American jobs were being shipped overseas and American wages were going down. And so there was a very strong conviction when Donald Trump ran for president that we don't want any more of these wars, we want to reduce our defense spending, um, and we want to take care of American issues, and we want to close the borders and take care of American workers instead of bringing in a lot of inexpensive workers. These people, the leftists, uh, the globalists and so on and so forth. Who are they? Okay, they're the really powerful people uh, in this country. The very wealthy financiers, uh, the owners of the media, the deep state bureaucrats, um, and the politicians that are controlled by this group of people. And you know uh, that whole Epstein episode showed how real that control is. I mean, they had you know dozens and dozens, if not hundreds, of really powerful, famous Americans going to his island and going to his parties and implicated somehow in all this sort of situation. So an example of the really powerful financiers are people like Soros, you know, who has enormous resources, almost unlimited resources, as much as a country practically. So what these people, what their goal actually is, in all seriousness, is they want to control the whole world. That's what they'd like to do, and that's what they're trying to push you know, every aspect of society and government in America to achieve for them. Um, it's the same universalist ideology that's just like uh, communism, uh, that's just like the neoconservative idea of controlling the whole world. That's what they want to do. And, you know, the, uh, the, the right analogy is this. So, uh, in the Bible, mm, the devil tempted Christ and he said, look, if you'll just come over to my side, I'll give you power over the whole world. You'll control everything, and you'll be like the king of the world. And it looks like these crazy megalomaniacs who are pushing these policies now were also given that choice, and they chose not like Christ, but they chose to have power, and that's what they're after. <laughs> It's very possible that, uh, that these radical leftists will be successful. You know, the situation reminds me very much of 
uh, what happened in Russia in 1917. Um, and America is literally teetering on the balance. So, of course, there could be an uprising from the people and uh, the good guys win. Or it's entirely possible, like in the Rus Russian Revolution, that eventually these radical leftists will come to power and they will enslave the country and terrorize it and do all the terrible things uh, to Americans that they did to Russians. So nobody knows right now what's going to happen. Uh, that's what makes this situation so terrifying. And the world should really understand that America is on the verge of going down the path that Russia went um, in the revolution. Well, it's a terrible tragedy for America if it happens, but it's a terrible risk for the rest of the world. Because if America becomes the radical leftist country uh, now, the way Russia became a uh, hundred years ago, um, you know, uh, with all its military power and all its economic power, this is going to be a huge problem for Europe, a huge problem for Russia and for China. So uh, all these countries should see it in their interest now to make sure that that does not happen. What's so interesting now is that the mask is off of the establishment in America and their radical agenda for uh, destroying freedom and destroying all the things that made America great. Um, and so tens of millions of Americans, you know, 50 million Americans now understand uh, what's going on. And that's a good thing in a way because it means that finally they'll organize and fight back. They've kind of been sleeping up until this point. The question is, is it too late? Have they lost the game already? So I think we're going to find out in the next couple months. So uh, one thing that has become clear to me uh, in watching uh, the opposition protests over the last couple months, it's a very interesting phenomenon, and that is that it really seems to bring out this idea that this is a battle, it's a spiritual battle between good and evil. And the reason I say that is because a majority of the people who come to these rallies and make speeches and participate in all this, they're constantly talking about Christianity. We are electing a man in Donald Trump who believes in the name of Jesus Christ. Shout amen! Go Trump! He represents the godly people of the United States of America. He is um, the man for this time in history, and God will use him. And it's, these, these protests have a very Christian atmosphere to them. People are singing Christian songs, people are praying, uh, uh, and it seems like the really strong believing Christians, the, the people who really, really strongly believe their faith, that they're the ones that feel called to step up. And it's, t to date, it's been a very small percentage of the population. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we thank you for this nation that was born in 1776. We pray in 2020, it would be born again. We pray for your spirit to move across our nation and we humble ourselves and we pray. We repent of personal sins, and national sins, and we humbly ask you to bless our nation and to bless our president, Donald Trump. Yes. Why are the followers of Christ the first ones to come out and go into the street and make speeches and try and get people to push back against what's happening? I thought it was very interesting and it was very odd because, you know, if you go into the public in an American typical public situation, you don't get the feeling it's a terribly Christian situation. Uh, people don't talk about Christianity all over the place. If you go to one of these Trump rallies, well, it seems like half of the discussion and half of the conversation is about Christianity and about how this is a spiritual battle and how about this is God's people fighting against the enemies of God and so on and so forth. And then when you bring into that a whole understanding that the ideology driving this radical leftist takeover of America is also atheistic, it all comes into very clear focus. So that's something very important to understand. Another thing that I think would be interesting for Russian viewers is that, um, you know, this is what's happening right now, it reminds me a lot, not just of what happened in 93, 
when uh, the people uh, tried to stand up against the liberal takeover of the country, but it also reminds me in a way of what happened in 91, when there was a putsch against Gorbachev. So what's happened really now is there's been a putsch, there's been a coup, and if you remember the atmosphere in the country in 91, there was this weird feeling for about a week um, where it looked like the, the leaders of the putsch were in control, and they, they'd taken certain things, and Gorbachev was somewhere in the south, and he couldn't be reached, and his communication had been cut off, and people thought, well, the putsch will probably be successful. I mean, they are smart people, they're powerful people, they know what they're doing. But in fact, they hadn't correctly calculated the mood of the country, the behavior of certain groups. And so that's what we're seeing right now in America, okay? There has been a coup attempt. They've tried to destroy the president, they've tried to dis destroy his supporters and his movement, and uh, there's this sort of strange quiet. And you don't know, is the opposition going to come back and push back against this coup? Or are they going to uh, give up and, and be defeated? Also, a very interesting aspect of this whole episode is um, are the parallels between Donald Trump and John F. Kennedy. Um, so both of these presidents tried to assert themselves against the deep state. In Kennedy's case, he was against the military-industrial complex. He wanted to reduce the tension with the Soviet Union. Um, he didn't want the CIA basically running the country and running the, the whole world. Um, and when he tried to move against them, he was assassinated. Uh, uh, by the deep state uh, uh, and, and other international actors that were trying to, uh, to stop what P Kennedy was doing. So Donald Trump, in a, in a funny way, is very much like that. Sixty years later, Donald Trump comes along and does something very similar. And you know what's very, very interesting about this is that Donald Trump is from New York City. And uh, JFK's son, uh, JFK Jr., was also a resident of New York City. And apparently Trump and JFK Jr. were very, very close friends and uh, were genuinely close friends. And so you could see how maybe they might have, the Trump might share some sensibilities with JFK Jr.'s father. What the, the, the... Um, oh, our Trump sign has been vandalized a few times, knocked over, kicked, bent out of shape, and yesterday someone stuck this tape on top of it. But we're not going to remove the sign. I don't want Trump to be taken away. 